Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Fluga said, uh, my name is Alex. I'm a member of the robotics team at OpenAI. Uh, tonight, I'll be talking about our progress uh, towards learning to solve dexterous manipulation tasks with a humanoid robotic hand. Uh, so, specifically, uh, I'll begin by discussing the motivation for this line of research, kind of what it means, uh, this research on dexterity, and we'll then describe our two most recent big releases, uh, Learning Dexterity from summer of 2018 and Solving Rubik's Cube uh, released this past fall. Uh, at the end, I'll add a small update with some more recent research we did uh, kind of along the same uh, research agenda. Okay, so let's begin uh, with uh, the motivation for this uh, line of research overall. Uh, so the goal of robotics at OpenAI uh, is to build a general purpose robot. Uh, that is one that can operate in the complex environment of the real world and carry out most tasks that humans can do. Today's robots are still pretty far away from this. Uh, so most consumer oriented robots are either very simple toys or tend to focus on uh, primarily obstacle avoidance, uh, which are things like Roombas, uh, self-driving cars, or autonomous drones. Uh, these are challenging in their own right and certainly very difficult problems, uh, especially with self-driving cars. Uh, they do not interact with their environment to the level that we're after. Um, kind of on the other end of the spectrum are complicated robots which do interact with their environment, such as in manufacturing or surgical robotics. Uh, however, today almost all of these are either executing just hard-coded behavior, pre-recorded trajectories, or are being controlled by a human. Building a general purpose robot is a daunting task though, so we had to pick somewhere to start. Uh, we chose to focus on dexterity, and specifically dexterity of humanoid robotic hands, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the human hand is able to solve a huge array of tasks, and uh, the world we've constructed is designed to a large extent uh, around the human hand. Uh, second, while the necessary hardware for uh, doing this, so anthropomorphic uh, robotic hands, has existed for a while, it has found little real world use uh, due to the very high difficulty in creating software capable of controlling this hardware. Uh, so why is it hard? Uh, the main source of difficulty Difficulty stems from the high complexity of the robots that are involved. Uh, for example, the robot that we've been using through this line of research, uh, the Shadow Hand, uh, has 24 degrees of freedom and 20 actuators. Uh, this is much higher than the like seven or eight uh, degrees of freedom that you typically see with robotic arms used in manufacturing. Uh, and also, when coupled with a relatively small form factor, this leads to a very complicated and generally less precise hardware, which in turn is very difficult to simulate accurately. Uh, so that's kind of a very quick motivation. Uh, with that, we can go ahead and start talking about the first set of results that I want to describe to you all tonight. Uh, this is uh, Learning Dexterity, uh, which we released in summer of 2018, uh, work done by all the fine folks that are listed here. Uh, note that I hadn't joined OpenAI yet at the time. Um, so this is our first project using the shadow hand. Uh, so we decided to start with a relatively simple task uh, of reorienting a wooded block as pictured here. Uh, so uh, that we can go ahead and start talking about how we did this. Uh, so our high level approach was uh, to use reinforcement learning to train a policy which then controls the robot. Uh, so over the past uh, like five or so years, uh, reinforcement learning has proven to be inc incredibly powerful uh, from the success with AlphaGo uh, to more recently with uh, the success of OpenAI 5, um, from where I'm working. Uh, but these approaches are incredibly data hungry. Uh, so you need a huge amount of training data to get these approaches to work. Uh, and for robotics, this is particularly challenging uh, since collecting this huge amount of data uh, for training the robots is both difficult and expensive. Uh, so here we have a video uh, from I think Google's so-called arm farm uh, where they uh, basically did try to build out a huge array of robots and train in the real world. Um, and I guess this is a sped up video, but you, you see there's uh, kind of a lot going on here. There's, it's, it's a very expensive setup to maintain and it's still kind of difficult to get working. Uh, so instead of going down that route, uh, we've decided to take what is called the sim to real approach, uh, which means that we train our control policy entirely in simulation uh, using a physics simulator and then deploy it onto the physical robot. Uh, this is much cheaper and far more scalable than training directly in the real world uh, but it does come with its own set of challenges, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, so here we have a, a video of, uh, from this physics simulator that we use. Uh, so specifically, this is from the Mujoko physics engine. Uh, and the video is showing our policy controlling the shadow hand here, uh, trying to solve the block reorientation task. 
Uh, so on the right hand side of the video, you see uh, this kind of transparent block uh, that's like kind of moving, looks like it's moving around. Uh, what's happening here is that uh, this is the desired orientation for the block. Uh, and once the hand is able to manipulate the block into this position, uh, we sample a new goal for it uh, to achieve. And this kind of continues uh, uh, until we get to either like 50 successes, uh, so 50 goals achieved, or we uh, drop the block. Uh, that's our simulation environment. Uh, so now let's take a quick look at our real world setup. Um, so the picture here is of what we call our cages uh, for running uh, robotic experiments. Um, so uh, the hand here is in the middle. Uh, you can see it's surrounded by a very large number of cameras. Uh, so most of the cameras uh, here are for the face-based motion tracking system. Uh, they think there's like 24 in total. Um, and that's used for some additional like sensory input into the policy. Um, only three of the cameras pictured here are uh, normal RGB cameras. Uh, so these are the ones that are circled on the image. Uh, the most relevant piece for this talk is that these three RGB cameras uh, are ultimately fed into a vision model, which is then used to produce uh, an estimate of the location and the orientation of the block, uh, which is then passed on to the policy when we deploy in the real world. Um, so what this means is that the vision model we train must also be capable uh, of achieving the sim to real transfer. Uh, so the problem with the sim to real approach uh, is that it's hard. Uh, it's very hard. It's hard because it's impossible to perfectly model the complicated robotic systems accurately, which means that policies trained in simulation generally perform very poorly in the real world. Uh, in general, this problem is known as the sim to real or reality gap. So rather than working endlessly to make the physics simulation closer to reality, we can instead employ a technique called domain randomization to force the policy to learn behaviors which generalize to a wide range of environments rather than overfitting to any single environment. One of the earliest examples of this technique from Sadagi and Eleven is pictured here. Uh, they trained a policy uh, to fly a drone in simulation on environments with a wide variety of textures rendered on uh, the furniture and the walls and the environment. Uh, and this allowed the policy to then transfer and work in the real world without having seen any real data. Um, at OpenAI, uh, in 2017, we used roughly the same approach to train a vision model uh, to predict the, an object's orient, position, position and orientation uh, entirely in simulation. Um, as you can see from this video, we're able to actually use uh, kind of pretty crazy looking uh, textures uh, randomized um, like onto the objects and everything in the scene. Uh, and thanks to uh, kind of the magic of domain randomization, this model is then able to transfer to the real world. Uh, so we took a similar approach then with learning dexterity. Uh, so for uh, this release, we had two different types of domain randomizations uh, that you see displayed here. So on the left, you have uh, the physics randomizations. Um, these are things like the friction coefficient, the object sizes, uh, even like gravitational force, et cetera. And on the right, you see uh, the visual randomizations which are uh, critical for trading the vision model, uh, which I previously mentioned. Um, here, uh, we use a different rendering approach than the previous video. So we use the Unity game engine here to render uh, more realistic looking images and kind of higher resolution, higher uh, fidelity. Um, and each column uh, you see on the right hand side, uh, it represents one single sample fed into the model. Um, so from each of the three cameras that I pointed out earlier, uh, the job of the vision model is then to predict the pose of the box, so the position and the orientation, uh, given this image. Uh, so with this approach to training and simulation with domain randomization in mind, uh, this we, we now talk about how we ultimately train our models. Um, so this diagram here is kind of describing the rough like flow of how it works. Uh, so uh, both the policy and the vision model training use uh, an internal framework called Rapid, which was originally developed for the uh, OpenAI 5 bot, um, but has since been used uh, throughout OpenAI for a lot of uh, reinforcement learning projects. Uh, note that we train the control policy here using reinforcement learning with state-based observations uh, rather than uh, from images. Uh, the reason we do this uh, is basically because it's easy to get these state-based uh, observations, so that is like the position and orientation of the block uh, from the simulator. Uh, and it's much, much easier uh, in terms of just like kind of complexity of setup as well as the amount of compute required to train the LSTM policy from state uh, rather than from images. 
Um, however, as I mentioned before, uh, we have this, uh, in the real world, we have to use a vision model to uh, predict the pose of the block. So uh, we also use the same rapid framework uh, to uh, train this vision model using, again, a highly, highly similar uh, distributed system setup. And then once we've uh, trained using this setup for long enough, we can then deploy it to the real robot. Uh, to do this, we uh, finally combine the vision model with uh, the policy. So we have the uh, vision model process, uh, the real frames uh, images from the cameras mounted around the cage. Uh, and this, predicts, this produces uh, an estimated pose, which is then passed along to the LSDM policy, which ultimately produces actions which control the robotic hand. Uh, so that's how it works. Now let's see the system in action. Um, so, oh, there's audio. <laughs> uh, so yeah, here's an example of our system performing object reorientation on a physical hand. On the right uh, is the desired orientation of the block. Once it's achieved, uh, we randomly sample a different goal. Sorry, I did not realize there's audio for this video. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, this goes on for a long time, seven full minutes of uh, 50 successful goals achieved. You can view the whole thing on YouTube later if you're curious. Um, so to take away the music now. Uh, so we also quantified uh, the performance of our system. Uh, so we measured the median and maximum number of successfully achieved goals over 10 trials on the real robot uh, with a few different setups uh, considered. Uh, so we can see here that the domain randomization is absolutely critical to success. Uh, we get basically no uh, transfer performance, uh, even from an LSTM-based policy uh, without domain randomization. Uh, we also find uh, that the LSTM uh, greatly outperforms a standard feedforward model. Uh, we believe that this is due to the memory present in an LSTM, which when coupled with our training approach, allows for what we've been calling uh, emergent meta-learning uh, or domain adaptation. Uh, so a bit more on that later. Uh, okay, so that's it for the learning dexterity release. Uh, now we'll fast forward to fall of last year when we released our work on manipulating Rubik's Cube uh, using the same physical setup. So in this work, uh, we use a shadow hand to solve Rubik's Cube. Uh, we chose this specific task because it built directly on the previous work uh, while also taking the difficulty of the manipulation problem up several notches. Uh, before we dive into the details here, I just want to clarify uh, the, the goals that we had with this project when we set out to do it, um, which you can see here. So the primary goal was to push the limits of sim to real transfer on an incredibly difficult dexterous manipulation task. Uh, note that we didn't care uh, for this project about learning to solve the Rubik's Cube symbolically as this only seemed tangential to our real research agenda around dexterity. Okay, uh, now for some details. Um, so I guess, just to start, at a high level, we leverage the same approach uh, from the previous release on learning dexterity. So basically, we try to combine sim to real with domain randomization. Uh, we use an LSTM policy and a vision model uh, separately trained in simulation um, and all of this. So uh, one early surprise of the project uh, was that it was surprisingly easy to solve this task in a simulator using a very simplified model of Rubik's Cube, as you can see here. Um, however, it turned out to be incredibly difficult uh, to transfer this policy to the real robot, as you can see from the video struggling there. Um, so basically we had a much harder sim to real problem uh, compared to the previous work. So at first, uh, like I had mentioned, we were just trying the same combination of reinforcement learning and domain randomization from learning dexterity. However, we quickly found that for this project, uh, domain randomization just was not scaling well enough. Uh, so we ended up having to continue to add so many more parameters that needed to be randomized uh, such that we couldn't feasibly set the correct ranges for each of them uh, correctly by hand. It just simply wasn't scalable. So instead, we introduced what we call automatic domain randomization, or ADR, uh, to discover the correct ranges for each parameter for us automatically. So I'll now quickly describe uh, what ADR does. Uh, so to begin, we can consider a non-domain randomization approach, which would consist of a single point in the space of domain randomization parameters corresponding to our best guess for the real value of these parameters. Uh, so what this means is you might try to like measure uh, the friction coefficients of the surfaces, you would use like the actual value of gravity on Earth, things like this. Uh, with domain randomization, we would define a fixed uh, box sorts around the starting point uh, in uh, domain randomization parameter space. So these, the box you know, corresponding to the, the fixed ranges 
um, in the high dimensional space. Uh, with ADR, we're able to start uh, with conservative initial ranges and then grow them automatically according to how well the policy performs rather than trying to initialize them to the perfect like maximal values. Uh, specifically, it does this by occasionally sampling each domain randomization parameter at its lower or upper bound and then evaluates the performance of the policy on the resulting environment. If the policy does well enough, ADR will then expand this bound in the direction that it was sampling. Uh, so if you run this for long enough, it kind of gradually uh, grows this, this box uh, and parameter space um, much farther than we had previously been able to tune it uh, by hand, uh, in part because ADR also kind of gives us an implicit curriculum uh, over these environments. So as things get more, like over time, the, generally the, the environments that you're trying to solve become more and more difficult. So uh, here we see an example of ADR at work on the domain randomization parameter governing the size of the queue. Uh, so you can see ADR allows us to initialize uh, this parameter just to the actual size of the cube. And then over time, the policy is able to uh, work with not just this size of the cube, but also one that's quite a bit bigger and quite a bit smaller uh, than the real size. Uh, but this is just one parameter. So again, the point of ADR is that we have so many parameters to tune that we can't do it by hand. Uh, so here you see the complete set listed out uh, from some internal analytics. Uh, it would be quite a pain to tune all of these perfectly by hand. And it's probably just not really a feasible thing to do given compute constraints. Um, so now I can talk a little bit about how we actually then trained it. So it's uh, largely the same setup. So again, we use the internal framework we call RAPID uh, to separately train an LSTM policy and uh, a convolutional neural net vision model and simulation. Uh, we then combine them in the same way to deploy to the real robot. Uh, so now for the results. Uh, so after much trial and error, uh, basically much, much trial and error, uh, we finally got it working uh, kind of early summer of last year. Uh, so here we have a video of the shadow hand successfully solving Rubik's Cube from a fair scramble. Um, so as of the last one, it takes a few minutes at real time speed, so I won't show the whole thing now, uh, but the video is also on YouTube and is also linked from our blog. So I encourage you to check it out there if you're curious. Uh, so once we did this, we also ran some fun uh, robustness experiments to kind of test the limits uh, of the domain randomization we employed, uh, including things like tying the fingers together, uh, putting a rubber glove on the hand, uh, or the uh, perennial fan favorite, the uh, plush giraffe perturbation. Uh, uh, note that none of these perturbations were included in the training data, uh, particularly the plush giraffe. That would be way too much work. Uh, we also did some analysis to better understand how ADR related uh, to performance on the real robot. Uh, so here we measure the size of the domain randomization parameter box uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, by the entropy of the distribution. So basically a higher entropy here means that ADR has expanded uh, the parameter space more. So we've covered uh, the policy has effectively solved more environments. Uh, encouragingly, when we ran this analysis, we found a correlation between this ADR entropy and the mean number of successes achieved in real roll rollouts. Um, so since we did this in the real world, we unfortunately don't have a, a huge amount of, of data, but uh, I think that the trend here we see is, is pretty clear and it's, uh, it's pretty uh, exciting to us uh, that ADR has this property. Uh, we also did a lot of analysis for the paper studying the emergence of uh, meta-learning capabilities in our policy. Uh, so in our case, uh, what we mean by meta-learning is that the policy has learned how to infer the parameters of its environment uh, so that it can adapt and more efficiently solve the task. Uh, so one piece of evidence for this meta-learning uh, is presented here, uh, where we attempt to measure whether the hidden state of the LSTM, so basically uh, at the end of a rollout, we capture uh, this vector that's uh, the memory of the model, like what is you know, kind of what is the state of it at the end of a rollout, uh, and try to determine if it has information about uh, the size of the cube that it's tasked with solving. Uh, so uh, of course we did this in simulation where we can easily uh, vary the size of the cube uh, automatically uh, across a wider range. Uh, so in this table, the rightmost column here is the accuracy that we obtained uh, from a linear classifier that's fit atop this hidden state, this memory, uh, to predict whether the cube size is above or below uh, the mean size of the cube. Um, so this being uh, just a, a binary classifier, the, the like random prediction accuracy would be 0.5. So the fact that we see all of these above, uh, well above 0.5, um, you know, in 
the confidence interval being above 0.5 is pretty encouraging. It tells us that uh, this information is contained within the memory. So the policy has learned how to uh, learn about the environment and first state about the environment. Um, and again, uh, it was exciting to see that uh, this accuracy only increased as uh, we ran for longer uh, and basically had a higher ADR volume. So. Uh, and yeah, that wraps up the discussion of our most recent two big releases. Uh, for more info in each, uh, I definitely just skimmed the surface here. Uh, there's tons more in both papers that are on archive uh, and also more information in our blog. So I encourage you to check this out. Uh, finally, we'll now discuss uh, kind of a smaller uh, result uh, from some work completed at the beginning of this year, which was published recently uh, in a weights and biases report that's pictured on the right here and linked uh, below. So uh, for this result, uh, once we had shipped the Rubik's Cube results, we decided to do a brief investigation into whether we could train a policy directly from images, AKA end to end, uh, cutting out the need for a separate vision model. Uh, this means the policy architecture, both in training and when run on the real robot, uh, looks like this, where uh, effectively, instead of having the vision uh, convolutional, convolutional neural network produce an estimate of the block pose, you have it uh, produce some embedding in a higher dimensional space representing the state of the environment, which is then directly fed into the policy, um, which then again produces actions. Um, so the important property here is that when you're training the model, you're able to backprop all the way through uh, the vision stack to learn the optimal representation for uh, the policy. So uh, for this investigation, we chose the block reorientation test uh, from the learning dexterity release that I talked about, uh, just because it's much simpler uh, to solve relative to the Rubik's Cube. We decided to start uh, by trying uh, behavioral cloning to more quickly train such a policy. Uh, so behavioral cloning works by first uh, training a state-based policy, as was done in the learning dexterity release, uh, which is then used uh, to effectively teach uh, a new end-to-end uh, -end student policy, uh, how to behave. Uh, so concretely what this means is you uh, allow the end-to-end uh, -end policy to uh, do its rollouts, so it'll try to act in the environment uh, just as you would in a typical RL setting. Uh, but then when you do optimization, uh, instead of uh, using something like uh, PPO or any kind of like policy gradient uh, technique like we, we've uh, been using for our past two releases, uh, you instead, uh, sample the uh, kind of optimal uh, actions from your teacher uh, model, so in this case, the state-based model, uh, and then uh, coerce the student uh, policy to behave like the teacher would have uh, in any given situation. Um, so uh, this effectively uh, replaces a reinforcement learning problem with a supervised learning problem, uh, where the policy gets direct supervision on its actions at every single time step. Um, and with this kind of swap to supervised learning, you get a number of benefits uh, related to uh, training speed and just the general ease of the problem, uh, which I sure mentioned here. So um, basically this, this made uh, this whole investigation much quicker and cheaper uh, to perform. Um, and we already knew that behavioral cloning uh, had a good shot at working because we've been using this technique uh, within the team uh, for over a year now uh, to do other kinds of experimentation. Uh, long story short, again, after a lot of debugging, uh, which is honestly 90% of this job, uh, we were finally able to get this working. Uh, so once we had a basic setup working, we then used uh, behavioral cloning to run a number of ablations uh, to find the optimal setup. Uh, so cloning was key here as it allowed us to more quickly run these ablations. Uh, so there are a few more that are listed in the report and a few that require a bit more context to set up. Um, but I think the most interesting and quick to explain uh, ablation we ran here was on using a pre-trained vision model. Um, so here uh, in green, we have a uh, kind of a from scratch behavioral cloning run with a randomly initialized vision model. And then in pink, we have a run where we initialize the vision uh, model uh, with the parameters from an already trained uh, vision model that was taken basically from the, the same vision model we used for the learning dexterity release. Um, so interestingly, we see a, a 4x speed up. Uh, I think it's not surprising we would see some speed up, but I think it's interesting that uh, the nature of the speed up, it's basically uh, eliminating this uh, kind of flat, like long uh, stretch that you see with the green curve here, um, during which time we're hypothesizing that maybe the, the policy is struggling to uh, kind of uh, 
learn the right representation of, of uh, its environment. Uh, so once we had this optimal setup uh, for doing behavioral cloning, we then kind of used it to run a single very large uh, reinforcement learning experiment. Um, so again, like basically from scratch, except for uh, using a pre-trained vision stack. Uh, so in green here, we have uh, the uh, RL experiment. Uh, and in pink, we had the behavioral cloning. Um, oh, and sorry, uh, I realized I forgot to mention what these plots uh, denote. But on, on the y-axis here, we have uh, the mean episodic reward. Uh, and on the x-axis, we have the uh, amount of frames collected. So basically, the amount of uh, training experience that has gone into the model. Uh, so from this plot, uh, you can see that it, there's a huge gap uh, in how much experience it takes to converge. Um, so uh, the uh, like total amount that it comes out to is about 30x more compute uh, for the reinforcement learning experiment than behavioral cloning. Uh, so this is just kind of a useful result to keep in mind uh, for us for future projects. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Nice. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, do people have questions? If you can uh, pop it up in the chat um, or the QA button if you're on Zoom. I know Charles has a question. Yeah. Um, so it's really uh, cool work and very impressive, like getting, you know, there's lots of difficult aspects to reinforcement learning and to robotics and to get them to both work together is really cool. Uh, the question I have uh, is one of the like salient features of the human motor system, especially the dexterity is haptic feedback. Like I get a bunch of information from my joints about the amount of tension, uh, about their position, about their relative orientation and like, you know, whatever massive data stream we get from our mm -hmm. skin. So I'm curious to what degree do folks at, are folks at OpenAI interested in incorporating haptic feedback to future versions of this? Or was its exclusion like a very, like, uh, yeah, met because it's not helpful or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think uh, there's a few aspects to this. Uh, the first is that uh, the, the hardware, I think, for this, this kind of sensing is a little more finicky to work with. Um, so the shadow hand actually does come with some of these uh, sensors. I believe they're like, uh, gosh, I can't remember the exact term, but there's basically pressure sensors in, in the fingers, like at each digit. Um, but they're very like kind of sensitive to all kinds of factors, uh, like, like air pressure or like um, uh, kind of other like things that uh, lead to them being very noisy, uh, which has made them like more difficult to incorporate. Uh, and then I think, Basically, uh, because of this, like, it's also a little more difficult to exactly simulate the dynamics with them. Uh, so, like, uh, I think the way the shadow hand worked is there is these little kind of, like, balloons of, um, I don't know if it was actually just air or some other gas uh, that would that kind of compress slightly and it would measure that. So that throws off the dynamics a little bit. Um, but I think longer term, it's definitely a thing that we're interested in because clearly it's very critical to humans. Um, like, we've, we've even tried, I think, uh, or we joked around uh, on the team of, like, trying a uh, like these like numbing agents you can put on your hand and see if we can still do some of these tasks and like uh, we don't really think like it's it's a lot more difficult. Cool. Thanks. Um, cool. I guess the other uh, it, we also have a tremendous amount of experience working with uh, vision like in the ML community we, we have convolutional neural nets that are this like you know sort of super weapon for handling vision tasks so do you also think it's a matter of algorithmic development that we need better tools for handling the kinds of input streams that things like haptic sensors provide? Or do you think that we have that technology figured out? Mm, that's interesting. Um, I would guess that uh, that won't be the blocker anytime soon for this. Um, but we haven't, we haven't tested it as, as well. All right, we've got a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, Soleim asks, uh, did you run behavioral uh, coding for the same number of frames uh, as RL? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I see, I, th I see the question. So like two, uh, 2 billion or 3 billion, uh, maybe it'll get better. I think there's another question I see related to um, the RL being better at the end. So this was a kind of a difficulty in constructing the plot. So um, I was showing the mean reward obtained during training, uh, but we also have like a separate uh, set of kind of evaluation on like a, 
kind of the maximally difficult environment. Um, and we find that uh, the basically the reason we stopped the behavioral cloning experiment when we did is because it had already fully solved the environment. So with uh, like the median um, performance was 50 successes out of 50. Uh, so the, the reward can go a little bit higher because you get um, I think benefits for, for other things, but uh, it didn't matter for us at this point. Gotcha. Um, someone, uh, Matisse asks, uh, how's it like to work on such big projects? Uh, isn't it hard to get the full picture of what you're doing sometimes? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think, uh, I, I personally really enjoy working on these big projects. Um, I think for robotics, uh, I can't really see like a, a way of solving really hard problems without having like a bunch of people focusing on it just because there's so much to figure out on the stack um, from you know getting the firmware right uh, getting the physical hardware set up right um, and all the way up to like you know designing the right uh, like using the right reinforcement learning algorithms um, so I, I agree it, it can be harder to like understand fully what's going on um, I mean I don't have full context on everything the mechanical engineers do on our team um, but I also think that's kind of fun because you there's more opportunity to learn new stuff what are some of the tools you're using to understand what's going on with these models? Um, yeah, so I guess the tooling we use, uh, so yeah, like I, I mentioned, we use weights and biases a lot for, uh, for sharing the reports um, and kind of like discussing uh, reports, uh, results internally. Um, the like tech stack, I guess, I don't know if that's the question, uh, is uh, uh, we're using PyTorch uh, to train these, uh, these models, um, which we've really enjoyed using. Um, and then we have like a bunch of internal stuff as well. Uh, uh, so Han asks, uh, how does domain randomization relate to data augmentation schedules? Uh, and how would the search and the reinforcement learning space translate to image tasks? Interesting. So I think, yeah, there is, I guess I, I sense in which so there's a relation between domain randomization and data augmentation. Um, I don't know as much about the schedules here uh, that Han that refers to. Um, I'm not like that expert in that field, but I guess the, the key difference here is that with data augmentation, I guess you're starting with uh, some real world data and then you're, you're perturbing it in some way to get uh, basically more data. Whereas in our case, everything is coming from a simulation. Um, so you don't really need to view it as like augmentation as much. Um, but there's definitely a relationship there. Uh, what's the team vision with this project, maybe in an year or two? Um, yeah, so I can't really talk too much about like uh, future work beyond like what I shared with the, the motivation. Um, and aside from just like our, our overarching goal around burning, building a general purpose robot. Uh, does uh, OpenAI plan on building CARES like Open a uh, APIs for reinforcement learning? Um, I don't, well, I don't think we'd have something like a like CARES. I think that the closest answer maybe is that we have uh, this uh, release called OpenAI baselines, which are kind of uh, like good standard implementations of RL algorithms. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the closest maybe. Nice. I also encourage the YouTube folks to ask questions. Right now the Zoom folks are asking all the questions. Uh, but this one question does come from YouTube. Uh, what was your most important learning in this project? Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, so I, I only joined uh, kind of March of last year. I think the most interesting thing to see was that uh, a lot of these, um, the problems that we ended up solving, uh, they felt at the end of the day kind of like more like engineering problems that we had to figure out. So what was really cool to see was that uh, basically when we go from learning dexterity to solving the Rubik's Cube, uh, the same, roughly the same formula worked, right? So we, we used reinforcement learning with domain randomization, um, uh, we introduced ADR, uh, which is critical to success too. Um, but at a high level, the same approach worked. We just had to figure out how to run it at the right scale and kind of solve a lot of engineering problems. Um, so I think that was really encouraging because I think like the promise for these approaches is, uh, is very high for challenging tasks. Nice. Uh, last question. This is just uh, me wondering, did uh, working on this project change uh, how you do machine learning or change what you think of as best practices but are not? 
where you discovered new best practices? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, let's see. So I think the interesting thing for me jumping on this project, so my background before this was more in applied machine learning, working on uh, sort of fraud detection. Um, so there, uh, the, there's far less emphasis on the algorithms themselves. Basically, all of the, uh, the work that you end up doing um, is in getting better data in or like better features. Um, so I think what's been interesting to see is that uh, with this work, we also like generally don't worry too much about the algorithms themselves. Uh, like, you know, we've been using um, PPO for all of these results is a great, uh, you know, policy gradient method. It's um, so that works really well. Uh, the main thing that we, you know, do end up having to worry about uh, is again, uh, the data that we're training on uh, only in this case, we have complete control over it. Um, it's all coming from a simulator. Uh, but I think it was just, it was interesting to note that it's, it's still just like the data that you're trading on that ends up mattering the most. So. Cool. Wait, I have one more question and then we'll end it. Uh, <laughs> so why, why did you pick the Rubik's Cube as the go-to problem to prove that the robot hand worked? Yeah, so I, I wasn't around for when we actually picked this. Um, my understanding is that uh, it's, it's basically uh, something that I think it's roughly like the most difficult, like single-handed manipulation task that you can think of. Um, so, uh, like, with, like, basically, if you have like a you know your wrist your wrist in a fixed position and you like have to do something uh, with just like your fingers, like it's uh, it's about as hard as you can imagine. Um, and it's also something that uh, kind of I think has been floated around. Like the idea of it has been like mentioned in the robotics community, and you'll sometimes see like you know stock photos like a robot at can with like a Rubik's cube next to it. Um, but no one's like really made a serious effort towards solving it. So I think, uh, you know, the kind of assumption that it would be too difficult to solve was like attractive. Nice. Uh, okay, I have actually off. one little quick more follow up. <laughs> so um, in uh, one, uh, one closely related world uh, that I'm more familiar with is the neuroprosthetics world, like the goal of generating, of allowing human neural networks to control robotic hands. And one of the tasks that turned out to be most difficult for that and that required haptic feedback was the manipulation of soft objects and like mm -hmm. things that are much more deformable than a Rubik's cube. So can you say anything about your experience using this setup and these algorithms for those kinds of tasks, like, you know, handling an egg or a Play-Doh <laughs> or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. So one of the, uh, difficult parts with training entirely in simulation is that simulators uh, today at least are uh, not as good at, at modeling deformable objects. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, you end up having way too many contact points and uh, it becomes like really expensive. Um, so we haven't really focused on this quite as much. Um, I think it's something where we believe like uh, once we push our sim to real approach far enough, we'll be able to, to do it. But yeah, it's, it's not a thing we've uh, attempted too much yet. <laughs>